Joining us now on the line from New York, New York, Eli Pariser. He is the board president of MoveOn.org and the author of The Filter Bubble, What the Internet is Hiding from You. Eli, that term will come as news to some people, so let's just start there. What's a filter bubble? Well, you know, it used to be the case that we all saw basically the same Internet. And increasingly, we don't. We see different things depending on who the Internet thinks we are and what the Internet thinks we want to see. So, for example, on Google, you know, most people think when they search for a term on Google, they're seeing sort of the result. That's not true anymore. Different people get very different results. Uh, sometimes they differ pretty dramatically. And it's all based on, you know, what Google knows about you. So, you know, this, this uh, phenomenon is kind of sweeping across the web. Uh, more and more websites have it built in. And the filter bubble is the personal, unique universe of information that's created when you're surrounded by these kinds of personalizing algorithms. I think it's fair to say, though, that even before the Internet came along, we sought out media that was particular to our interest. How is the filter bubble different from that? Well, uh, it's different in a couple important ways. Uh, one is, you know, the seeking out part is actually important. When you turn on Fox News or you turn on MSNBC here in the States, you expect to see a political slant, but you know what the prism is through which you're seeing the world. You know what the editing rule is, and you know what's being edited out. And uh, the problem with these filters is because they're invisible a lot of the time, you don't actually know that your experience is kind of being personally tailored at all. It's very hard to tell uh, who these websites think you are and therefore what they're editing out. You have a big kind of unknown unknown. You don't know what you're missing. Well, if the filter bubble's invisible, how did you find it? <laughs> well, uh, it, you know, my experience began on Facebook. and. Uh, you know, I had gone out of my way to meet people from a variety of different political perspectives. I really wanted to hear uh, from conservatives as well as progressives like me. And uh, I had added them as Facebook friends. And one morning, I woke up and logged onto Facebook and noticed that they weren't appearing anywhere. As it turned out, what Facebook was doing was it was, you know, it was editing my news feed and it was saying, you think you're interested in these people, but actually we can tell you click on the links much more when there are things that you agree with. We're going to show you more people like that. And just like that, the people who thought differently from me disappeared. And you didn't tell Facebook you wanted to do that. They just presumed that that's what you wanted and therefore did it. Is that right? Well, Facebook actually, I mean, when I talked to engineers at Facebook, the thing that, that one of them said very candidly was, look, we love to come up with clever new ways to get people to spend more minutes on Facebook. That's what we love to do. And it doesn't necessarily matter what people are doing on Facebook as long as they're there. So this is part of a uh, you know, very smart strategy to uh, continue getting more and more people to spend more and more time on Facebook. Uh, because it's reflecting back to you stuff that makes you feel good, you want to click like on it, and y you don't see the, the, the links and the friends that may cause you a little more heartburn or, heartburn or uh, you know, maybe suggest that you rethink some things. So Facebook is creating a filter bubble. Who else is doing it? Well, as I said, you know, Google is, is you know, one of the big companies that's focused on this. Really, sort of behind the scenes, there's this massive race underway online to uh, be the company that has the most complete do dossier of information about each of us. Facebook is on that hunt, so is Google, so is Yahoo, so is Microsoft. Everyone's trying to kind of be the place that knows the most about you, and they, and they want that so that they can then offer you these personalized ads and personalized services and personalized content. Um, and in some cases, you know, that's, that's fine. I, I, I actually appreciate that Amazon sometimes shows me products that are related to the products that I'm looking at. But when you talk about personalizing information and tailoring uh, the news so that only, you, you only see uh, what, you're, what you're likely to click on, that's a dangerous thing, and that's increasingly what's happening. Yahoo News, the biggest news website on the Internet, uh, is now personalized. Different people get different versions of the news, and that's when things start to get very concerning. Well, let's follow up on that a little bit. It gets concerning, you say, because there's no chance you're going to run into sort of divergent or discordant views, and that's not good for democracy? Is that sort of where you're coming from? Well, uh, there's a couple different problems here. So one is uh, you're less likely to see views that don't make you, uh, you know, that you're less likely to click, 
which will often be views that people that you disagree with. The second is, uh, you know, you're you're likely to see a narrow slice of the picture rather than the whole picture. So basically, you know, these algorithms are it's a lot of very complex math, but they're not uh, nuanced. They don't have a nuanced understanding of human behavior. Uh, they're just looking for sort of the most obvious things that you like, and so, you know, it's it's more at the level of well, this person is a male. Let's show him more stuff about technology and cars. Uh, than it is, you know, really reflecting who you are and what your interests are in some kind of uh, nuanced way. So you also basically have this problem of kind of almost self stereotyping. Your your um, your media is increasingly sort of related to the most basic salient points about your profile. So I, I get that, and and this is all done algorithmically. So in essence, what you're saying is we have no human editor anymore. Is that a is that a significant problem not having that quote unquote human editor? Well, you know, one of the things that this research in the book uh, made me do was was to shift how, how I was thinking about the internet. I grew up as someone who was who was really excited about the promise of the internet to create a better democracy and a better world. And uh, in my work at Move On, you know, that's what that's what we were excited about doing building building an internet that actually was going to help people have a voice. And th there was this mythology that we all repeated to each other uh, that is very familiar to people who are excited about the internet, which is that, uh, it, you know, there were sort of the bad old days when there were human editors who uh, controlled the flows of information and they were elites and they uh, only let certain kinds of information through. And then the internet came along and it decentralized everything. All of a sudden, everyone could talk to everyone and, you know, utopia emerged. And obviously, the problem with that is that it hasn't. And uh, it, it, not only that, but actually, it's it's a flawed metaphor. That really, uh, the sort of those those editorial gatekeepers that existed in the broadcast society are still with us. There still are uh, a few entities that control the flow of information. It's just that now it's code at Google and Facebook, and not editors at uh, you know the New York Times or the CBC or or wherever. Hmm. Steven Johnson wrote a book called Where Do Good Ideas Come From? And I want to read a quote uh, to you and our viewers. This is from a TED talk that he gave. And he said uh, last year, what has happened that is really miraculous and marvelous over the last 15 years is that we have so many new ways to connect and so many new ways to reach out and find other people who have that missing piece that will complete the idea we are working on or to stumble serendipitously across some amazing new piece of information that we can use to build and improve our own idea. That's the real lesson where good ideas come from, that chance favors the connected mind. Does the filter bubble affect our ability to innovate, for example? Well, yeah. I, you know, I think Steve Johnson was thinking about uh, an older version of the web in which uh, you could very quickly find yourself uh, in some far-flung uh, area of interest or topic area that uh, really, you know, had nothing to do with you. That's increasingly hard to do because uh, so much of your experience is, you know, the, the links that you see that you might click on are links that have been generated for you based on what the Internet thinks you're interested in, what, these, what this code thinks you're interested in. And the danger here is that actually, you know, where, where new ideas come from is the juxtaposition of uh, you know, things that are, you know, very closely relevant to the topic at hand and something that comes in from less field, left field. That's why so much innovation happens when people are out taking a walk or, uh, you know, in, in the bathtub, uh, you know, that, that actually when you look at what's happening in the brain, it's these connections that are not closely related. And what personalization wants to do is show you the stuff that's very closely related to whatever the topic is that you're starting with. That's what it knows to do is kind of to map these ideas on a, on a plane and say, this idea is very close to this other idea. It's not going to show you the thing that's far away, but may actually be uh, the solution to your problems. How about the filter bubble affecting our ability to learn? Any impact there? Yeah. Uh, you know, there are a couple of important uh, psychological phenomena at work that a perfectly personalized world will miss. Um, one, which is sort of the bedrock of why these sites are doing this in the first place is this idea of confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is essentially the tendency we all have to, uh, to feel good and, uh, and agree more and, and seek out more uh, information that confirms what we already believe 
uh, it's it you you feel like it's right if it says what you already know is true. You feel like uh, it must be a flawed study or flawed journalism if it doesn't. And um, the filter bubble kind of uh, bakes that into the fabric of the websites that you're visiting, so that uh, it, you know basically that little dopamine hit, hit that you get when you see something that validates what you believe, you get more and more frequently. You're getting sort of personalized. Uh, hits that say, yes, you're so smart, this, you're, you're so right. Uh, and the danger here is that learning, by definition, uh, is, is you know, a, an experience where you're coming into contact with the unknown, with things that you aren't familiar with, that aren't narrowly relevant, and that may be disturbing or uh, concerning at first. You know, th those are some of the most important experiences that we have, is when we hear things that we really actually you know, didn't mean to hear, didn't want to hear, but they change how we look at the world. And in a perfectly personalized world, in the filter bubble, you know, you're, you're less likely to see that stuff. Well, I would think politically this could be real trouble because how exactly do you persuade people at election time uh, of a view that may be not your view if you've got all of your feeds set up only to get that which you already believe in or you only read the articles that you are already on side with? How do the political parties get around all this? Well, uh, you know, I think it's a challenge because people are increasingly sort of cloistered with their own views. I think there are two challenges. One is, uh, it, you know, I think for many people, politics falls out of the filter bubble entirely. It's not a question of the left versus the right. Uh, it's a question of, you know, in my filter bubble, I want to see stories about, uh, you know, hockey and, uh, and, and really very little else. So why would I see the story about, uh, you know, about, about some important national or international event? Uh, I'm not going to click on it as much as I am about, about sports. Uh, you know, that, that kind of optimization would be really easy to do and really dangerous because you lose sight of these big common problems. The second piece is this piece about polarization, and it's just the fact that, uh, it, you know, you basically have this phenomenon where people are, are less likely to even know that there's an alternate argument. There was a great study done in the United States with Rush Limbaugh, a famous conservative pundit, where they had, uh, you know, uh, they, they had liberals listen to Rush Limbaugh. And it wasn't as if people radically changed their positions or realized that they had been wrong all along. But what it did was it, is it increased the, their own sense that they might be wrong. And actually, most of us sort of by definition might be wrong a lot of the time. And it's important to know that. It's important to engage with that kind of humility about the world rather than just assuming that, that everything you believe is always right. Just curious, has Rush ever been wrong about anything? <laughs> a few things here and there. <laughs> okay, let's in our last few minutes here then figure out how we're going to pierce through this bubble. Uh, what do we do? Well, I think you know there's a couple there's a couple pieces here. So on an individual level, um, there are a few things that people can do to stop the kind of tracking of the information that's the source of this. I have a, a list on my website, thefilterbubble.com, but a start is using a private browser. But really, that's just a temporary solution because uh, these companies are very good at finding new ways to track data about you. Um, th the other piece of the kind of individual puzzle is actually to seek out information that makes you uncomfortable, that uh, you may disagree with, that you know, it is possible now to build these information flows that really are diverse and really contain a lot of this information if you seek it out. And so getting out of the kind of passive mindset that the filter bubble is about and going and seeking this stuff out is important. At an at a institutional level, these companies, I think, need to be really step up. They, you know, they have this enormous responsibility now that most of the traffic on the internet is moving through you know, the, a few very specific points. And they really need to use that responsibility better. Uh, they need to give people some control over their filters. They need to show us when they're doing this so that we know when the content that we're seeing is being personalized and, and tailored. Uh, and they need to build the kind of editorial ethos that we saw in the 20th century in the best editorial you know, uh, uh, headquarters 
uh, they need to build that into this code that is not just enough to show people the stuff that is going to make them click most or watch the most ads, that also we need to show people stuff that uh, is important for them to see and that uh, you know has important uh, social consequences and uh, that makes them uncomfortable but actually exposes them to different views, that we need to do all of these things. Well, let me put, I just want to follow up on that, on the, I guess the second thing you said there. We, we need to seek it out. We need to actually, uh, we need to challenge ourselves and seek out views that may be different from ours. And I, I, I wonder how, you know, that's a tough thing to do. With mo most people are doing all they can just to get through the day, you know, managing their, their business lives, their, their jobs, their kids. You know, we're all living these just-in-time lives where you've got to get this one off to piano lessons and that one. Anyway, you know the scene. And sometimes after that kind of a day is over, you're really not interested in provoking your mind through a difficult debate. You want to sit back and just lie back in your own echo chamber and listen to views that are concordant with your own. How, what, what kind of well, magic thing can you say to people to, say, to get them to say that after that kind of a day, you should even provoke yourself even further to seek out divergent views? Well, I, you know, I think the best media does this. You know, we all have a part of ourselves that just wants to sit back and be entertained and, uh, you know, watch what's sort of most easy. Uh, and we all have a part of ourselves that wants to be knowledgeable about the world, a good citizen, a good part of our communities. And uh, the best media essentially balances those two forces, the long-term aspirational self and the short-term more, com more compulsive self. Um, and you get a bit of each. You know, you get some information dessert and you get some information vegetables and you have a balanced information diet. And, uh, you know, the danger with the filter bubble is that it's increasingly easy just to strip out the information junk food, the stuff that, uh, yeah, it, it, it's very appealing, it's, you really want it, but it doesn't leave you feeling very nourished in the <laughs> long run. Um, I think we need to balance those things. A balanced information diet. That's a nice way to put it. Eli Pariser, it's good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you.